Well, maybe there was some miscommunication that led to the misreporting, but I just want to make sure that you're thanked for correcting it because I don't want to mislead the audience about that. It's really important. With that said, why don't we get to uh, one of my favorite developments in federal government uh, over the last several months? It involves uh, FTC Chair Lena Khan. She's killing it, and yeah. here's an example of why. The Federal Trade Commission is suing one of our country's top anesthesia staffing companies. The lawsuit is against Anesthesia Partners and its private equity backer, Welsh Carson Anderson and Stowe. The FTC is accusing both of scheming over the course of a decade to acquire anesthesia practices in Texas, getting a monopoly over the market and driving up prices. Just when you thought suing Amazon would take up all of her time and energy, <laughs> Lena Khan head of the FTC strikes again. This time she's suing private equity backed medical staffing group, um, a medically backed uh, staffing group that uh, allegedly is violating antitrust laws by scooping up and consolidating anesthesia practices in the state of Texas. Now this has terrible consequences for patients, especially when it comes to their resources and how much they pay for care. Um, now the agency brought the civil lawsuit in federal court against U.S. Anesthesia Partners and Welsh, Carson, Anderson, and Stowe, which is a private equity firm that operates out of New York. Now, U.S. Anesthesia Partners is pretty massive at this point. They have about 4,500 clinicians serving a whopping 2 million patients, okay? Now, the FTC claimed that the group and the private equity firm financing it were consolidating doctors groups in Texas, which again has some consequences when it comes to how much money you pay for the care you need. So Khan said this in a statement announcing the lawsuit. Private equity firm Welsh Carson spearheaded a roll-up strategy and created uh, U.S. anesthesia partners to buy out nearly every large anesthesiology practice in Texas, along with a set of unlawful agreements to set prices and allocate markets. These tactics enabled USAP and Welsh Carson to raise prices for anesthesia services, raking in tens of millions in extra dollars for these executives at the expense of Texas patients and businesses. Mm -hmm. Listen, sometimes you hear liberal Democrats talk about like girl bosses. This is, this is, this is a girl boss, yeah. unafraid. And you know, despite all the attacks she gets, she keeps fighting and she fights for ordinary people who are getting screwed over by these business practices. She also said that the FTC will continue to scrutinize and challenge serious acquisitions, roll-ups, and other stealth consolidation schemes that unlawfully undermine fair competition and harm the American public. And guess what? This case seems pretty open and shut to me, mainly because of the statements made publicly by their own executives. I'll give you a little taste. Brian Regan, the head of Welsh Carson's health care group, who sat on the board of U.S. Anesthesia Partners, was quoted in the lawsuit as telling lenders who were financing a key deal that the firm planned to, quote, build a platform with national scale by consolidating practices with high market share in a few key markets and to improve negotiating leverage with insurers, meaning maximizing profits. But hey, maybe that statement wasn't clear enough for people. I'll give you another one. After learning of the strategy, an executive in a practice the firm bought in Austin, Texas, responded, awesome, cha-ching, according to the suit. Yeah. So, Ramesh, what are your thoughts on this? Because this has been an ongoing issue. Uh, some of the mergers and acquisitions that took place uh, for U.S. anesthesia partners happened under the FTC under the Obama administration. So in 2015, um, one of these uh, mergers happened. And of course, that FTC didn't really do anything to stop it. Things are a little different with Lena Khan yeah. and Biden's FTC. What are your yeah, thoughts on no, it? No, I mean, I, I, I actually have been following um, Dr. Khan's work for many years, mm -hmm. dating back to her time at Columbia Law School, uh, where she authored perhaps the most cited, widely cited and influential paper on the need and need to uh, to regulate and break up Amazon, actually, right. yep. which is why Amazon very soon after her appointment to chair the FTC 
um, sent various sorts of essentially cease and desist types of letters well beforehand. And Dr. Khan, um, along with Tim Wu, a, a, another cherished colleague of mine, um, are two of the better folks in the administration, um, along with folks in the National Labor Relations Board. I know you've spoken about that on the Young Turks. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, this is kind of what we get with Biden Harris, we have some legitimate, um, I guess we will call them progressives, but they're essentially truth tellers. They're legitimate scholars who are investigating the political economy, which is essentially the basis by which uh, private corporations are able to usurp and dominate and therefore strangle free markets. And um, I think what's important to note in terms of this specific lawsuit, as well as Lena Khan's previous actions and, and discussions in relation to um, other mega consolidations is all of this is going after what we call the platformization mm -hmm. of everything, right? You can imagine, you know, with the world of one of free markets, but actually the website or the so-called service or institution you go to to access that so-called free market is some type of platform. And, and you know, they, they present themselves just like Amazon. Okay, you can buy potentially anything and everything on Amazon. But what n very few know is that behind the scenes, and this in, in the case of Amazon, it's mysterious algorithmic processes. Right. But in this case, it's also very similar in its own right. It's just mysterious, you know, kind of processes behind the seen with this big pharmaceutical platform, um, there's lots of ways of gaining the system, um, manipulating products, manipulating prices, manipulating who get what it gets exposed to what, to what. And all of that lacks any transparency, and all of yes. it is actually a violation of a free market. Yeah. So Adam Smith would be turning over in his grave if he saw the status quo of what has happened with not just mega corporate economics, but mega corporate economics that violate a free market that has come to be right now. And, and yeah. Adam Smith even not to get too academic. No, no, about I it. love that you're mentioning this. You know, Jenk um, referenced a little bit of Adam Smith and, yeah. and ha his views on, right. you know, monopolies and, and this kind of, you know, yeah. dominance uh, and lack of choice in the market. Uh, and I think it's really important to understand that because it, when you don't have options, when there aren't multiple companies competing with one another, they can raise prices to whatever they want. And that is the problem that the FTC has noticed under the leadership of Lena Khan. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you brought up Wu. We're going to go to a video uh, sure. where he addresses this very issue in just a moment. But did you want to finish yeah, that yeah. point? Yeah. 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 So you actually literally used the term stealth consolidation yeah. um, to, to, discuss, to discuss that very issue. And that's mm -hmm. exactly how platforms function of, of all types. They in a stealthy way, in a way that's hidden and disguised from the transparency of the so-called free market, actually manipulate prices, construct consumption, and so on. And so that's actually exactly what's happening. And Smith actually, Adam Smith even argued for many things that should lie outside of the domain of the free market. He called it moral sentiments. Right. So Smith himself recognized the incompleteness of the free market. I'm, and I'm no Adam Smith acolyte necessarily, but what we have now is a massive zombification Mm -hmm. through hidden, mysterious, opaque practices that manipulate and strangle markets. Because what we have now is in almost any domain of contemporary capitalist life, it's not actually a free market on any level at That's all. exactly right. I totally agree with you on that. And I wanted to go to uh, this video featuring Tim Wu, who is an expert in antitrust. Uh, he is an advisor to the Biden administration on antitrust-related issues. And during a fairly recent appearance on CNBC, he addressed how you know, the consolidation in the healthcare industry is really where we see the worst practices in regard to how consumers are affected by costs and lack of options. Let's watch. The last 10 years, last 20 years, a lot of mergers happened that did not benefit consumers. Airline mergers, mergers all over the health healthcare industry. And they're looking back, a lot of hospital mergers, like, look, prices went up, things got worse, we blew it. Healthcare is a lot different than technology, though. It is, it but it's actually worse, I think, some of the merger really? practices. Yes. Like, where, where do you think so? uh, Most of the hospital mergers you look at have led to higher prices, worse patient outcomes, and have led to uh, workers getting less money. We really got to crack down on hospitals, for example. Um, some of the practice group, uh, Lena Khan just brought a case study against a practice group merger where you roll up all the anesthesiologists and then they raise their prices. I mean, these are not good for American consumers or for American business. 
So I, I want you to weigh in on the uh, distinction that the CNBC host tried to make between, you know, tech, because you're an expert in tech, sure. and, uh, you know, the healthcare industry. And I love Right now, though, we are monitoring uh, our D.C. Bureau as our Peggy Collins get ready, gets ready to sit down with the head of the FTC, Lena Khan. Let's take you to D.C. FTC Chair, thank you so much for your time today and for joining us. Thanks for having me. And it's actually, fun fact for all of you, it's the 109th birthday of the FTC today. So happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a joyous, a joyous occasion. <laughs> So, Chair Khan, let's start with the news because there's a lot of it out there today. Just hours ago, the FTC dropped a case against one of the world's biggest companies, Amazon. And in the case, you allege that the company is monopolizing the online marketplace in a way that's harmful for consumers and for sellers on the platform. But Amazon's already come out and said it's going to fight you in terms of challenging the case and that the case is a radical departure for the FTC from its core mission of protecting consumers. What is your strongest argument in the case? So look, this is a case about a set of unlawful tactics that Amazon has used to maintain its monopolies. Um, we note in the complaint both a set of anti-discounting tactics that Amazon uses to punish any seller or retailer that dares to discount, and ultimately these sets of tactics deter sellers and retailers from lowering prices and closes off an entire dimension of price competition. The other set of tactics we note is a coercive scheme that Amazon uses to effectively require sellers use its fulfillment service. Um, and this in turn ends up stunting the development of independent fulfillment providers and ultimately also deprives actual and potential rivals of scale. And that's really the core theme here. Um, these are a set of tactics, but ultimately Amazon has pursued them to deprive actual and potential competitors of the ab ability to gain the scale and momentum needed to effectively compete online. And having achieved and protected its monopoly power, our complaint details how Amazon is now exploiting that monopoly power in ways that harm customers, both the sellers, the tens of millions of American families that use Amazon to do their shopping, but also the, um, uh, sorry, the, both the shoppers, but also the sellers, the, the hundreds of thousands, the tens of thousands of, of sellers that use Amazon to access uh, those shoppers. And it's done that through actively raising prices. Uh, Amazon takes close to one out of every $2 from sellers that, that use its platform. Uh, it's also degraded its service by adding a whole set of pay to play ads that make it more difficult for consumers to find what they're looking for and steers them to higher price products. So uh, really encourage everybody to, to read the complaint. It details all of this conduct in great detail and we're really looking forward to moving forward with it. So one of the things in the complaint is this phrase stru structural relief, that you're seeking structural relief in this case, which implies a breakup. What would that look like? So at this stage, the complaint is really focused on the issue of liability. Uh, we lay out a scheme that we believe violates the U.S. antitrust laws. Uh, what we note in the complaint is that these different aspects of Amazon's scheme have an aggregated effect. So the harm is accumulating. There are feedback loops between the harms. And so the net exclusionary effect of Amazon's conduct is quite significant. Um, ultimately, we'll want to make sure that any remedy is halting the illegal conduct, preventing a recurrence, and ensuring that Amazon is not able to profit and benefit from its illegal behavior. So right now, we're squarely focused on the question of liability. But uh, when we get to the issue of remedy, those are going to be the principles will be focused on. So just staying on the issue of remedy for a minute there, what do you think the company should be doing differently? So the complaint lays out a set of tactics that we believe are illegal and that are illegally elevating and inflating prices for the American people. So at the very least, uh, any relief would require that the company halt those tactics. But as I noted, uh, effective relief also needs to be restoring competition to this market, uh, which we'll be asking the judge to do as well. And when you think about the prospect for winning the case, how would things change for consumers and sellers if you do in fact win? So this case is ultimately about competition and competition that has been foregone because of Amazon's unlawful tactics as the complaint lays out. Uh, as a result of that 
people are paying higher prices, right? Consumers are paying more than they otherwise would. Small businesses are having to pay a 50% Amazon tax right now. And so ultimately, the complaint is seeking to restore the lost promise of competition. Greater competition will mean lower prices, better quality, better selection, uh, and greater innovation. And that's ultimately what this case is about. So Amazon will say that it's providing a platform that has a mix of products on it, but also when it comes to merchants on its platform, it's offering more and more services to them, shipping, delivery, advertising, in terms of why they're, um, like, the charges that they have. How do you respond to that? So the complaint really goes in, in some detail about the different ways that this, you know, tax effectively has been increasing steadily um, and the way that that can be evidence of direct evidence of monopoly power. Um, interestingly, at various points, Amazon did experiment with giving sellers more leeway uh, to use seller fulfilled prime. But once Amazon recognized that that would threaten its monopoly power, uh, it switched that off, even though sellers were effectively meeting the same standards that, that um, FBI does. So, uh, you know, the complaint really goes through all of this in, in great detail and lays out why we believe these are unlawful tactics that are hurting the American people. And you mentioned just a bit ago paid advertising, that Amazon's doing more of this, and that comes up in the complaint as well. What concerns you there? So look, ads can be useful. Ads can be relevant. Uh, what the complaint surfaces is that Amazon has used ads in ways that actually degrade the experience for shoppers. Uh, that make it more difficult for shoppers to find relevant search results, and that actually steer shoppers to higher price products. So that's actually a degradation of service that we claim is also direct evidence of Amazon's monopoly power. Uh, you know, in a competitive world, if you have a company that's both hiking prices and worsening services for customers, that's the type of situation that should create an opening for rivals to come in, to attract business, to grow. But it's really Amazon's uh, exclusionary scheme that is keeping that from happening and what's enabling Amazon to effectively be exploiting its monopoly power with impunity. What do you say to critics who say by doing these types of cases, these big swings, that you're actually getting in the way of business and the free markets? So look, this case is entirely pro-business. Uh, it is, you know, tens of thousands of businesses that are dependent on Amazon to reach shoppers uh, that increasingly are paying one out of every two dollars, as well as being subjected to all sorts of, you know, arbitrary tactics. Um, so we believe that this lawsuit, if we're successful, will actually entirely restore the promise of free competition. Uh, our free enterprise system is one where companies should be competing on the merits and not be able to protect their monopoly power through illegal tactics. If you are successful, just going back to that question about uh, structural relief, could you see a world where Amazon is, you know, not one big company, but has, you know, different parts of it and terms of breaking it up and having different parts of the business be sole entities. So look, we'll want to, you know, get to the question of remedy when we get there. Um, but ultimately, the key is going to be making sure we understand what's required in digital markets to fully compete and what the aggregated harm has been in these markets through Amazon's unlawful conduct and how do we make sure that competition is fully being restored. So a lot of people will point to this paper that you wrote in 2017 about Amazon, and they point to that as, you know, rooted in your approach to antitrust and what you've brought to the job. Do you feel like today, by dropping this case, you actually have come full circle from that paper in 2017? Look, in this job, I'm a law enforcer. I took a note to really enforce uh, the laws. And this case is the result of really meticulous, careful work by our, by our staff over many years. Uh, we really followed the evidence where it took us. And as the complaint details, uh, we believe there are facts that show Amazon is violating the antitrust laws. And that's what the case is really about. This is actually not the first case that you brought against Amazon. I believe it's the fourth. And one of the others was more focused on prime services. And earlier this month, you actually added three executives to that complaint um, in terms of the charges are alleging that the company has duped consumers in terms of signing up for prime services, but also made it really hard to cancel. What was what message were you trying to get across by adding those three Amazon executives to the case? 
Look, these are decisions that we always make on a case-by-case basis. Um, There's a legal standard you have to meet in order to show that individuals, you know, had the direct ability and authority to participate or direct the conduct. Um, And so, you know, the the amended complaint really lays out why we believe that's the case. Uh, We want to make sure that we apply the law in an even-handed fashion um, and are not just going after fraudsters and, you know, fly-by-night scammers while ignoring, uh, you know, unlawful conduct by larger entities. And so we want to make sure that we're even handed and applying the law without fear or favor. Before we move on from Amazon, because you've been very busy at the FTC, so there's other things we want to get to, but what's the most important thing you want consumers to take away from how you're approaching Amazon? Because it's so much of a part of different people's daily lives. So look, this case is about the competition that has been lost because of Amazon's monopolization and their unlawful tactics. And consumers should be entitled to lower prices, to more competition, to more innovation. Uh, Similarly, sellers should be entitled to greater competition. And this alternative universe of greater competition, greater innovation, lower prices, better quality has been lost because of these tactics. And that's what we're really trying to get justice for. So one of the other things we write a lot about, um, in addition to big tech at Bloomberg, is private equity. Um, And the Amazon case that came out today is a landmark case, but you actually have a case that came out earlier this month that involves the private equity industry, which is the first of its kind as well. And in that case, you're really looking at the practice of roll-ups in the private equity industry, where they're buying um, multiple companies in the same industry. What concerns you there? So this was a lawsuit that the FTC filed last week against uh, USAP and and Welch Carson, the private equity firm. Um, And as the complaint lays out, you know, there was a scheme here to roll up the market. Uh, There was a concerted scheme to do serial acquisitions by a whole set of anesthesiology practices. And then after buying them, raising the price. Uh, raising the price for Texas patients, for businesses. Um, And so those are the practices that we're going after. Um, Historically, there's been less attention paid to stealth consolidation through serial acquisitions or acquisitions, each one of which may not trigger concern, but where in the aggregate you have a roll-up. And so we thought it was incredibly important to be scrutinizing these practices. And as the complaint lays out, you know, this ended up monopolizing all sorts of markets in Texas, ultimately raising prices. We also, in the complaint, detail certain price-setting agreements as well as market allocation schemes that we think also unlawfully resulted in Texas businesses and patients paying more than they otherwise would have. So you also indicate that this is an area that you're looking at and will continue to look at. And actually, one law firm out there said, you know, it's required reading for investors and private equity firms that are doing the practice of buying multiple companies in the same industry. So if you're in the private equity industry, where can they expect you to look at next? So, look, we follow where the facts take us. Um, This this investigation and case was in the context of anesthesiology, but uh, to no secret, there's been a lot of reporting about other areas where we may have seen these types of roll-ups. And so we want to make sure, you know, we're scrutinizing where there may be the most harm. So in the past, these type of acquisitions have gone through. How hard is it going to be for you to convince people to change course and maybe, you know, look at blocking some of these type of acquisitions in the future? So, The FTC recently, uh, alongside the Justice Department, uh, rolled out proposed merger guidelines that lay out the kind of analytical tools and frameworks that we'll be using to assess whether mergers or acquisitions violate the U.S. antitrust laws. Uh, In those guidelines, we note that serial acquisitions can also violate the antitrust laws. And when enforcers are looking at a particular transaction, we may look at that transaction not just in a silo, but as a part of an overall pattern of acquisitions. Uh, We also recently proposed an update to the HSR form. Uh, This is the set of information that companies provide to us if they're proposing a deal that triggers notification. Um, As part of that additional information, we would also be seeking a list of prior acquisitions that companies made in a particular market. And so we're hoping that that could also give us more visibility on the front end uh, to be blocking any type of unlawful roll-up scheme and preventing front harm on the front end rather than years later.